Hello, welcome or welcome back to the Crime Gist. You, Kamakawa, can call me Damisa. Our case today will take us all the way to County 016, which is Machakos County. This county borders Nairobi to the east. It has an estimated population of 1.1 million residents. That's the land of the Akamba people who are the dominant habitants of this county. But basically, it's home to Kenyans from all walks of life. Machakos County is also home to important and industrial residential towns like Siokimau, Mlolongo, Adi River, Mavoko, and Machakos Town. In 2016, however, a terrible event would happen in Machakos County that would leave its residents and the country at large in mere dismay and disgust. Today's case is one that caught global attention. From domestic and international communities to human rights watch groups, it basically spread like wildfire across the world. Why, you may ask? No worries, just stick around to find out. It was a very, very messy situation. But it all started with one bitter man who terrorized an innocent man for months leading up to his eventual death. The sad thing about this case is that other innocent people who were not supposed to die ended up dead. Don't get me wrong, not that anyone was supposed to die, but these guys were basically collateral damage. So you might want to buckle up as we dive deep into this one. We'll start from the very beginning to understand this mess and how it all came to be. In the year 2015, one Josphat Mwenda, a border border rider in Machakos County, had an encounter that would forever change his life. As he and his friends enjoyed a night out in a bar, they were ambushed by police officers and arrested on allegations of gambling. The arrest was not smooth at all, as during the arrest, a senior cop by the name of Frederick Leliman roughed up Mwenda and was very violent towards him. In this rough process, Mr. Leliman took out his gun and shot Mwenda in the arm and upper chest for absolutely no reason, as witnesses would later recount. It was just a blatant misuse of a firearm from this officer. After the shooting, Leliman took Mwenda to the hospital. But upon his discharge a few hours later, he took Mwenda straight to Mavoko police station. There, he was locked up in the cell for three days before being charged in Mavoko law court with several criminal charges. Mr. Leliman accused Mwenda of being in possession of 14 stones of marijuana, resisting arrest and gambling. He pressed these charges against Mwenda, I bet in a bid to silence and intimidate him, knowing what he had done. He had blatantly shot an unarmed civilian. But these trumped up charges would however flop. This terrible encounter was just the beginning of a prolonged and sustained harassment against Mwenda that led up to the ordeal that is the focus of today's episode. Mwenda, upon his release and full recovery, decided to file a complaint with Aipoa, accusing Leliman of shooting him. Aipoa is a body that I have already talked about several times on this channel. It's a body that investigates rogue officers, independent policing oversight authority in full. As Aipoa launched an investigation into Mwenda's claims, the officer caught wind of the news of this report. His anger and pride, as you would imagine, got the best of him. And so what does he do? He goes ahead to have Mwenda followed and spied on. He would arrest the Boda Boda rider a second time that year on December 13th, 2015, claiming that he had committed a traffic offense. This, of course, was a lie and a way of the officer to continue harassing Mwenda. Mwenda, at this point, understandably, began to fear for his life. He decided to seek help from yet another body, the International Justice Mission or the IGM. He was basically crying out for help. The poor guy was so scared as he knew he was dealing with a dangerous person. I imagine he may have had sleepless nights and worries of being followed wherever he went. 
Leliman seemed relentless. The IGM came on board and tasked a human rights lawyer by the name of Willie Kimani with the case. It also provided them with a taxi driver to ferry them every time they went to and from court. So at this stage, Mwenda had launched complaints with both the IPOA and the IGM. Both were now working tirelessly and doing the independent investigations on Mr. Leliman and the claims made against him. Leliman, on finding out that he was under investigation, became very worried. He then decided to approach his friend, a guy known as Peter Ngugi, to share his predicament. And things would only get worse from there. So let's just do a little bit of history on Peter Ngugi and how he and Leliman came to meet. So we can understand why this is the guy that Leliman trusted with his quote-unquote problem. This Pitangugi guy was a mtumba seller, that is a second-hand clothes seller, and a hawker before he was recruited as a police informer or spy in 2009 for the Flying Squad. The Flying Squad doesn't exist anymore. It was disbanded back in 2019. So it was while at this job that Mr. Ngugi would meet a guy known as Stephen Lele, a dirty cop whose name will come up again in this story. Mr. Lele was in charge of Mlolongo police station at the time when today's case happened. He had introduced Ngugi to other dirty cops around him like Mr. Frederick Leliman. Mr. Stephen Lele had been a national hero who was awarded for his brave actions during the Westgate attack. He had hit national and global headlines in 2013 when he led other officers in a rescue mission in Westgate. He had even been shot in the leg while in the middle of this heroic act. However, that image of a hero would come crumbling down when today's case came to light and his character was questioned over other murders that had occurred around him. There's still more on him coming. As mentioned, Mr. Stephen Lele had introduced Ngugi to Mr. Frederick Leliman. And as we will see, this friendship was doomed right from the beginning. Part of Ngugi's job as a police spy over the years was to do their dirty jobs and clean up their mess. So this is why Leliman trusted Ngugi to help him with the problem at hand. On the last week of May 2016, Mr. Frederick Leliman called Ngugi and requested a meeting at Connections Bar in Lolongo. He told Ngugi that he needed to silence Mr. Mwenda, the guy who had reported him to IPOA and the AGM, because these bodies were already tightening the noose on him. As Mr. Leliman and Mr. Ngugi sat and talked at Connections Bar, a murder plot would slowly unfold. The traffic case against Mwenda was scheduled to be heard on June 23, 2016. The two mooted this day as the perfect day to execute the murder plot. Peter Ngugi consequently visited Mlolongo OCS, Stephen Lele, and told him about Mwenda and Officer Leliman's predicament. So, Stephen Lele, although would not be an active participant in what would take place, was aware of the fact that there was some tension brewing and a possible murder plot underway. The fact is, if he was a good officer, he would have stopped this before it got any worse. But he was as dirty a cop as the rest. On June 22nd, a day before Mwenda's case, Ngugi and Leliman, who had become bosom friends, met again at Mlolongo Police Canteen, where they farmed up the murder plot. Ngugi was to spy on Mwenda's movement, while Leliman and his team prepared a perfect spot to execute Mwenda. Mr. Leliman, meanwhile, registered two Airtel SIM cards using a random lost ID. He gave Ngugi one card and remained with the other. Their plan was to use these Airtel SIM cards to communicate and plot the murder. On the material morning, June 23rd, at around 9 a.m., Joseph Moirori, a taxi driver, drove Mwenda and his lawyer, Mr. Willie Kimani, to Mavoko Law Courts. In that court session, people recall that two witnesses testified against Mwenda. 
Of course, this was Mr. Leliman's goons. Remember, this is the second trumped up charge against Mwenda, and this is the traffic offense one. The first charge that had flopped was the gambling one, and now here he was with yet another false charge, this time a traffic offense charge. When the court adjourned, Gugi, who was on the lookout, notified Leliman. The victim's movements were monitored in and around the courtroom at Mavoko Law Courts. By the victims here, we are talking about the lawyer, Willy Kimani, his client, Mr. Mwenda, and their taxi driver, Mr. Joseph Muirore. Eventually, the three were traced, followed, abducted, and ferried in Leliman's vehicle to a container somewhere in Siokimau AP post. Present in the abduction were Ngugi, Mr. Leliman, Officer Stephen Cheburet, who was Leliman's colleague, and another guy by the name of Kamenju. Leliman, meanwhile, instructed Ngugi to take possession of Mwirori's car and dispose it. Ngugi would drive the vehicle and abandon it at Kwambira, somewhere in Limuru town. He also switched off the victim's phones before disposing them. At Siokimau AP post, the three were locked up from midday until nightfall without food or water. Leliman's allies and colleagues, Stephen Cheburet and Sylvia Wanjiku, failed to book the three. I guess this was to ensure that they were not identified or traced back to the AP post. Leliman and another officer who was at the station at that time, known as Officer Leonard Mwangi, left the station and went to Mlolongo Bar to have a drink. They left the victims in the AP post with their two colleagues keeping an eye on them. Ngugi would join them at the bar later after disposing Mwirori's car. Back at Siokimau AP post, Willy Kimani noticed that he had a pen in his pocket. Being a lawyer, I bet he carried that almost everywhere he went. He took the pen and a piece of tissue paper from his pocket and wrote something down on the tissue paper. He tied it to an electric socket holder that was in the room and beckoned a Boda Boda rider, that is a motorbike rider who was passing at a distance. The rider approached and jumped off his bike to pick up the socket. The lawyer, almost in a whisper, told the guy, please call this person. It's urgent. Tell her to come now as we are in danger. On the note was Willy Kimani's wife's number, scribbled down. At around 7 p.m. the same day, while still at Connections Bar, Leliman received a call from one of the officers manning the station that Kimani had tried to reach out to his wife. I guess he had been caught red-handed. Leliman panicked. They all immediately left the bar and were joined by Mr. Kamenju. Mr. Kamenju was instructed by Leliman to bring his car as it would be useful in the coming hours. Kamenju, remember, was also present in the abduction. But can you imagine he remains a mystery today and is still at large. At the station, Leliman picked the keys, opened the cell and handcuffed the three from behind and ordered them into the boot of a Nissan wing road. His Nissan wing road. Mr. Leliman, Peter Ngugi, Mr. Kamenju and Officer Leonard Mwangi then drove to an open field along Mombasa Road. This would be the scene of the crime. At the scene of the crime, they were each given duties. Gugi would hand the victims over to Leonard Mwangi, who would then lead them to where Kamenju and Leliman would execute them. It would later be revealed that these men spent close to three hours going back and forth on whether to kill the victims or not. It is said that Ngugi and Leonard Mwangi were of the opinion that the men should be spared. But Leliman and Kamenju wanted them dead. As Leliman was their leader, they had to go with what he wanted. At 11pm that night, Mwenda, the first man to be killed, 
was strangled to death using a rope and a polythene bag over his head. His body was then stashed in a sack and thrown in Leliman's car boot. Mwirori was the second. He was strangled using a second polythene bag over his head and his body was also stashed in a sack and thrown into Kamenju's car, the second car. It was said that Mr. Mwirori was stashed into two gunny bags that were then tied in the middle because he was a big and tall man. Willie Kimani, the lawyer, was the last guy to be killed. He was also strangled using a rope and a polythene bag and stashed in Leliman's car with the body of his client, Mwenda. The two cars then proceeded to Oldonio Sabuk River in Machakos County, where they dumped the body. They then drove back to the bar where they ate and drank before dispersing for the night. The bodies of the victims were discovered a week later in a river more than 100 kilometers away from the point of abduction. Call data, 8 cigarette butts and energy drink bottles at the murder scene, however, gave them away when the murder came to life. A test conducted on the cigarette butts matched Ngugi's DNA. Ngugi was then tracked down and arrested. He would later turn into a prosecution witness and spill all the beans on this plot to murder. In Gugi's confession, he named all the persons involved in this conspiracy who were swiftly arrested as well. While being detained, Leliman is said to have attempted to bribe Ngugi with 15,000 Kenyan shillings to omit his name. But this too failed to work. Ngugi had already agreed to a deal on testifying on all that took place in exchange for a lesser charge or sentence. The other officers arrested alongside these two were officers Sylvia Wanjiku and Stephen Cheburet, who had kept the three at the cell without documenting it, and had watched them from the point they were brought in to when they were removed to be executed. Stephen Cheburet, to make it worse, had participated in both the abduction and also holding the three at the cell. Officer Leonard Mwangi was the other officer arrested alongside his three colleagues. The trial began in 2016 and the prosecution presented 46 prosecution witnesses. There were 14 defense witnesses including the five accused persons and 117 exhibits in the trial. The prosecution put a strong case on how the five participated in the abduction and killing of Willy Kimani, Josphat Mwenda and Joseph Muirori on June 23, 2016 after the trio left Mavoko Locots. It put out a strong case on how the three were later killed and dumped. Their bodies would then be discovered in River Athi, Machakos County after a long week tedious search. Among those who are called to give evidence include lawyer Willie Kimani's former colleagues, witnesses who had discovered the bodies floating at the river, and also the border border rider who the prosecution said was the last person Kimani talked to and who had picked the distress note that was written by the lawyer on a piece of tissue paper. The rider testified that when he called the number on the note, it went straight to voicemail, and he only got a call back from the number hours later, which unfortunately was too late to save Willie. Remember Mr. Stephen Lilley? He and Peter Ngugi were both made prosecution witnesses in this case. The strongest evidence the prosecution adduced was a confession statement given by Peter Ngugi, detailing how a scheme to kill the three was hatched and executed and his part in it. This was more than enough to nail the perpetrators. This case would drag on for years and years, and after hearing both sides, judgment date was set for July 2022. This judgment came a month after the 6th anniversary of the disappearance and murder of the Mavoko 3 as the three victims had been dubbed. Despite much media coverage, the case progress had been slow with close to 100 adjournments. The adjournments had bred uncertainties about the outcome of the trial, but the day was finally here. On this day, it took a four-hour judgment to find three police officers Sergeant Frederick Leliman, Stephen Cheburet, and Sylvian Jockey 
and police informer Peter Ngugi guilty of murdering the Mavoko 3 on June 23, 2016. Police officer Leonard Mwangi, surprisingly, was acquitted of all three counts of murder. Not that Leonard was an all-innocent man. I guess they just didn't have enough on him to convict him. Leonard was as dirty as the rest. We will see just how in a few. Back to the judgment. Mr. Frederick Leliman's involvement was very clear. The murders were premeditated and had been hatched by Mr. Leliman, who was the master planner even several days before the execution of the plot. The conspiracy involved high-level planning and organization, meticulously carried out, and the use of technology with mobile phones and police radios. The offense involved kidnapping, detention, and inhuman treatment of the deceased persons. While clearly he had a grudge against one person, Mwenda, he had captured and killed three people, not caring about their lives and the fact that they had not done anything to him to deserve what he did to them. For his actions, Leliman was given a death sentence. The second accused person, Stephen Cheburet, received 30 years behind bars. Stephen stood by his colleague Leliman and stuck with him on every step on the material day. He did not have any personal vendetta against any of the deceased persons. However, he had played a critical role in abducting and holding the deceased persons in his police post where he had been the senior officer on duty that day. As for the third accused person, Sylvia Wanjiko, she received 24 years behind bars. Her role was to keep the deceased persons at the police post, reporting back to her colleagues all the way until the time the deceased persons were removed from the post and taken away to be murdered. She was the youngest and the most junior and the only lady in the group. As the judge would say, yes, being a police officer and being a junior has significant need for discipline and order in the force. That discipline and order, however, cannot include aiding and abetting, enabling a crime, and eventually concealing and denying any knowledge or involvement in it. This was said in response to the fact that she had continuously maintained her innocence even though it was shown that she actively participated in keeping the deceased persons in the police station. Had she been candid at any stage of the investigation or the trial, it could have been a factor that could have served as a positive extenuating circumstance in the mitigation. As for her, she was handed 24 years in prison. Peter Ngugi, the informant, who was also a defendant in this case, was handed 20 years in prison. He had confessed to the police, which helped immensely in this investigation. It was his confession that had shaped the entire investigation. During the sentencing, Josephat Mwenda's wife was immensely consumed by grief. She fell off her chair and passed out, and other court attendees rushed to her rescue. She was later resuscitated, but as she tried to respond to the media after the sentencing, she passed out again. I can only imagine all the emotions that she was feeling at once. My heart goes out to her and everyone else who was affected by this awful tragedy. All in all, justice was served. If you think that is the end of that, then wrong. More would be revealed on this corpse and all their dirty ways. As this case was going on, Ipoa and IGM had uncovered so much dirt on Frederick Leliman and some of his colleagues. In fact, he and Stephen Lelei would face yet another double murder charge over the shooting of Elizabeth Nduku and Jacob Mbai. On May 27, 2016, in Kitanga Hotel in Mlolongo, Mr. Lelei and Frederick Leliman shot Elizabeth and Jacob. They later lied that they were responding to a robbery incident in a certain bar. The bar owner denied having had a robbery there and wrote a statement to that effect. Did you guys notice the dates? The crazy thing is that Elizabeth and Jacob were executed by Mr. Lele and Mr. Leliman barely four weeks before Leliman and his group would execute Mr. Willie Kimani and his client. The much celebrated hero, Mr. Stephen Lele, was now having it rough. His character was now out in the open. 
It was uncovered that these officers had a history of tracing and executing anyone actively involved in the prosecution or investigation of cases where they were adversely mentioned. In yet another case that came to light during these investigations, Frederick Leliman and Officer Leonard Mwangi, the officer who was acquitted, were also charged with another murder, the murder of Peter Mutua Musioka, which occurred on June 2nd, 2016, at an unknown location in Machakos County. Notice the date again? This murder occurred three weeks before the killing of Willie and his group. In short, Mr. Stephen Lelei and Leliman killed two people on 27th May 2016. A week later, Leliman and Leonard killed Musioka. And then three weeks later, Leliman, Gugi, and the others killed Willie Kimani and his group. Wow, the sheer lack of value for human life. Clearly, these cops thought they were untouchable. They were on a roll, taking lives, covering up their wicked deeds, and basically abusing their powers and duties as police officers. As you may have already noticed, the constant in all these cases was Frederick Leliman. As for the three murders we focused on today, it is very clear that these murders were meant to interfere with the cause of justice. These victims went through fear, torture, and excruciating pain as they waited for their turn to be killed. They were kept inside the boot of a car and taken out one at a time to be murdered. The murders were executed close by so the victims could hear the thumping and blows being inflicted on their colleagues, the screams, the shouts, the groans as they were being killed. The fact that each knew they would be next to face their fate must have caused them extreme fear, stress, and psychological torture. A crude weapon was also used to batter the victims to create excruciating pain. The deceased were then put in gunny bags and dumped into a river intending to conceal the murders and make the recovery of their bodies difficult. Again, what sheer disrespect and lack of value for human life. It's extremely disgusting what these officers did to Willie, Joseph, and Josphat. The scary thing is that these offenses were committed by a group of people who have taken odds to serve and protect. I'm just glad they got what was coming to them. Thank you for sticking around to this point. As usual, please don't forget to subscribe, comment, and share this episode with other true crime junkies like yourself. I'll see you right here on the next one.